now so that I know it's recording. So one of the things we wanna start with today is just kind of checking in with each other about how we're doing and, and how we're feeling. We know that um, being able to check in with our emotions during the day is one way that we can do some self-care. Take a moment, see how you're feeling, ground it with yourself and own it and then be able to decide what you wanna do and how you wanna to respond to it because so much is out of our control. So thinking about today, we would like you to think, how are you feeling today? Are you a little sunny and cloudy out there? Is it more like a thunderstorm? Is it more like it's super windy? I don't know if any of you live in the high desert or I live in the low desert where I am. It's been really windy and really hot. Or is there a rainbow? Is there going to be a rainbow behind all of this? Or are you just feeling sunny today? So checking in with myself today, I felt really sunny. I felt very encouraged. I had a good business meeting yesterday. We have a good plan. I feel like I, I'm gonna start taking some ownership of things. So I'm feeling good today. If everybody would just take a minute and check in. Oh, I forgot there is one more and that's whether or not it's snowing or not, really cold. I don't know where that might be this time of year, but you might be feeling a little chilly. So we want to talk about our emotions. Just check in today in the chat box, make a note, how are you feeling today? And if you want to say why, go right ahead. We're just going to take a couple of minutes here, have everybody check in, start to build a community of all of us that are in the room together, get to know each other sort of um, through the chat box. So please go ahead and check in with your chat box and then Patty's gonna, I see her smiling, so she must be seeing some responses. I don't do the chat box while I'm running the video because I can't do them both. I'll lose Somebody you. posted sunny with one cloud, which <laughs> I'm gonna guess there's a story behind that and you know, for you, for you to know and us not to know. But. So again, just take a moment, check in with yourself. That way now you can calm yourself, you can ground yourself, you can remember that this is not gonna last forever. Perhaps that one cloud is gonna move away or more clouds are gonna move in. Like me, I want a few more clouds. It might make it a little bit cooler. Um, in some way that there's gonna bring some relief to what's going on for you. So thanks for checking in. So just to give you a brief overview of what our learning intentions are for today, <clears throat> we're going to start, about, uh, start with uh, talking about how to use outcome data to implement PBIS principles in the high school setting. And um, we'll give you a glimpse at a data brief that's written specific for high schools. Um, we'll draw a little bit of information out of that. Uh, and then we're gonna, we'll move into talking about the use of behavior specific praise and acknowledgements to improve student outcomes. Um, and, and thinking about how we can provide that acknowledgement um, both virtually or from a distance as well as um, when we have the opportunity to be face to face with our students again. And you know, I, I challenge you to think about acknowledgements, the delivery of acknowledgements, one, uh, I always, like to say that that's a teaching strategy it's not a gimmick it's not oriental trading it's not a store <laughs> acknowledgements are that's a teaching strategy but i challenge you to think about acknowledgements as a tool for building relationships with students especially now um, making connections and again given the distance that we experience from our students and and all of the webinars i've been doing and opportunities I've had to interact with people and we have people from all over the country on on this um, particular webinar I'm hearing that that students really miss you they miss their teachers they miss school I know I know there's some that don't but by and large students really um, really appreciate the connections they have with with teachers um, and an acknowledgement as a form of communication because by communicating acknowledgement uh, in that way, we're, we're really pointing out those behaviors that we want to see continued. So those are our learning intentions today. Um, Barb and I will try our best to communicate those to you. 
And in the true spirit of PBIS, we want to help, uh, we want to share the expectations for today that we are respectful. Um, everyone has already shown us respect uh, the, the community of learners that's online here by putting yourself on mute, uh, using the chat box to communicate between one another and also between Barb and I. Um, being kind, so being thoughtful of all people in your community and um, just you know, really important to remember that this COVID knows no races. Um, it's it's you know, um, important to, rem to remember that. And uh, continue the stay at home order as it is delivered in your particular community. Um, use physical distancing, <clears throat> excuse me. And then be responsible, increase your social emotional connections more than ever. And we're hopefully gonna provide that opportunity for you today through the breakout room. But this is, these are challenging times and that social emotional connection between adults, but also between us and our students is really critical. I want to be reminded too, while we've been doing this for a while, we always have a few people that say they haven't used the chat box yet. So if you're not familiar with it, if you hover around the bottom of your screen, or for some people, it could be on the top of your screen, you'll see options come up and one of them will be chat. So just click on that. The chat box will come up. More than likely, it's going to pop up in the middle of your screen. And again, just move your cursor around until finally you can grab it move it over to the to the bottom corner or the upper corner, wherever you'd like to see it. So just a quick reminder for some of those people that um, don't really know where the chat box is yet. So this is the, the cover of a data brief that was written, um, well, it was uh, printed in September of 2019, so it's very current. Um, and the data that was used in developing this brief came from interviews with teachers and coaches um, in high schools around the country. And there are just some, it's literally a brief and there's some really, um, I think, profound takeaways uh, from this. First being that there are really four types of data that we monitor, um, per, you know, of course, K through 12, but we're really thinking and focusing on secondary schools and in this case, high schools that we focus on typically attendance, we focus on behavior. Um, we also pay attention to course performance, i.e. what are, you know, how are students doing with credit accrual and with their grades and school climate. The brief also goes in to talk to, uh, into a conversation about accessing data and making sure that someone on our team has access to data as, as a way of um, really supporting the problem solving process certainly goal setting, and then some conversation about how do we share the data with stakeholders, uh, because we know that contributes to ownership of this initiative. But I, for the purpose of our time together, I just kind of want to zone in on attendance. And, you know, I said to Barb yesterday when we were planning, I'd sure be curious to know what are, what are teachers, what are schools experiencing in terms of attendance for our students right now? And I've really heard um, estimations uh, all over the place. So could you just share with us um, and, and the larger community here, wh what, would you, um, what would you say is your attendance rate? What percentage of your students are um, connected with the school, with the learning experience? Um, and how, I'm just curious also, how do you know? Are, are you, is there a measurement tool you're using? How are you, how are you recording that? So I'm gonna give you just, um, a minute if you could post that in the chat that would be really helpful this is a way for us to become a community of learners and to see what each other is doing around the whole idea of how are we monitoring who's actually checking in with us and taking advantage of our distance learning um, and how are we doing that maybe even what roadblocks you might be running across and, and patty mentioned what uh, what source you're using? What kind of data source are you using? Are you collecting it based on who shows up in your webinars? Is it on work completion? Is it on hours, amount, amount of minutes? How are you doing that? Um, would be really helpful for us to share with each other and, and get a sense. We're trying to get a sense of that nationwide, actually. Yeah, and someone started out the chat by saying, how do you define attendance? And so thanks, Barb, for kind of expanding that a little bit. Um, but it looks, it looks pretty, um, you know, I'm seeing 40 to 80 percent 
Um, and I know some places distance learning is virtual online and some places it's not, it's snail mail and maybe the bus routes that um, provide supplies and, and um, food for students. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I think it's really helpful in, as we all read this, understand that we're kind of in the same boat. You know, there's not huge variability and this is a struggle that I think the high schools are, are facing pretty much um, everywhere. So let's jump forward and think about how this development of relationships, our um, intentional outreach in a, in a way to connect with students um, and the communication opportunities that we might well have to create now that we had before in a much more um, organic way, how those three kind of concepts can improve attendance. Um, and like I said, I, I'm hearing more and more, and I have a daughter who's a senior, um, that, that, you know, they really do miss school. No, they don't miss getting up at 7 a.m., but, but they miss the connections that they have with their friends and with the adults as well. And, you know, just to honor that relationship that, that teachers have with students. Um, go ahead, Barb. Yeah, and I think to be thinking about all the different ways that we can build those relationships and those connections and that communication, even when we're doing distance learning, um, because we know that when we do that, it's going to improve attendance, which we also know that the more time we have with them, the better their outcomes are going to be for school. So kind of a, a highlight of coming soon. As I mentioned the, the um, data brief, we've also got an acknowledgement brief that'll be coming out. It looks like the end of June. Um, so you can look for those, and I should have mentioned, those will be on pbis.org. And if you look under the high school section, so this will be an, a brief specific to um, acknowledgements and high schools. And just kind of a little sneak peek at some of what we uncovered through um, through the uh, exploration for writing this, there, were, um, there was a survey done and it included 96 high schools and the feedback, and Barb, could you go ahead and do all of the bullets on that for sure. me? Thank you. Um, so the, the responses that the interviewers got from these 96 high schools, by and large students um, are frequently recognized for good behavior. They found that the students rated that the lowest of these other features which are listed on the bottom. And in the same, on the same note, the teachers did, the staff did as well. The staff also recognized that acknowledgements um, are one of the lowest implemented features. And so I, I kind of summarize that in truth by saying that most students and adults, um, I think it's fair to say we want a school-wide um, culture that's positive. And so when we hear some pushback around we shouldn't be acknowledging students, um, I think the question in, in response to that is then does that mean you're okay with student behavior in your building? Because acknowledgements, again, is a teaching strategy. It's a tool for improving uh, or prompting behaviors that we want to see um, demonstrated in our school. So I think for a lot of us, it's defining what we mean by acknowledgement. Somebody asked earlier, what do you mean by attendance? The same thing here. A lot of us have that feeling or that understanding acknowledgements is that old reward system. Um, and that's not what we're talking about at all. And we're gonna get into depth with what we mean um, by acknowledgements. Can you go ahead and put them all down, Barbara? <laughs> I'm so not good with animation, sorry. <laughs> that's fine. So just kind of let's talk for a second about some basics of acknowledgements in high school and and really just with with PBIS in general that the acknowledgement system and I want to emphasize the word system is really needs to be a school wide commitment and it needs to make sense. And so, again, we aren't operating in the buildings of a K, you know, K six school. And so I'm not sure that we're going to necessarily practice what respect looks like in the bathroom, right? We're going to do what makes logical sense in supporting our teenagers and to be successful at school. And the same kind of thinking needs to apply to acknowledgements in high school. So we want that school-wide commitment and we want there to be a logic associated with it. And I encourage you to think and, and make, you know, if you, if you get pushback at school, bring into the conversation that acknowledgements, again, are about establishing relationships, they're about, oh, it's a way to communicate a desired behavior. And it's also an opportunity for a connection with students. 
That's why we always say, you know, provide acknowledgements to students that you don't know because it's an inroad into, into a um, introduction or relationship. You know, I was working with a group of students in Santa Ana, a group of high school students from, I think, four or five of the different high schools there. And we were talking about the basic principles of PBIS, and they really went off on this acknowledgement system piece and that how important it is for them to know what they're doing is what we wanted and what was expected and what looked right. Um, they told us that you cannot tell us enough because the teachers were saying, all right, well, like once a week, we'll bring it up. And they were saying no, every minute, every day. They wanted not praise necessarily, but they wanted the acknowledgement of what was happening and that we were on the right track, just like we do with academics. They felt like they needed that behaviorally as well. And I think in our current situation, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the new normal term. I just can't adopt that. I'm not willing to accept that. Um, but I think we're primed for thinking about acknowledgements in a different way. And so for those schools who are happy, that if you have a school store and you're using tickets, I, I credit, I mean, that's fantastic. I don't wanna take away from that. But right now that method is, is a little more complicated. And so it puts us in a position to think about how do we use acknowledgements as a tool, like I said, for relationships, communication and connection. And we don't collect office discipline referrals right now. So what if we shifted to thinking about using acknowledgements to increase engagement? And engagement is attendance right now. And you know, I, I do wanna honor the fact that not everybody is providing or has the opportunity to provide virtual learning, I know that. But can we use acknowledgements as a way to increase engagement? And let's pay attention to, because we're data folks, right? Let's pay attention to the numbers that you just provided us to see if those increase if we implement some level of acknowledgement system. I think you already covered that idea of building a sense of community, right? Yeah. Good. And these are, um, this is an example, two different um, uh, visuals that I, that I really appreciate when thinking, again, recreating our definition of acknowledgement and focusing on the system. The one on the left is kind of a flow chart. It was, a, it, this is, um, a, I think it was a school in Oregon. I want to honor that. Um, and they used power acts and notable deeds. And what strikes me about this visual is that they have, it, they have outlined for staff and students alike that this is the process for delivering acknowledgements, these two types of acknowledgements at this school. So they begin with the teach, and it's kind of hard to read, I recognize that. Um, the, the, the teacher provides that uh, power act to the student, then goes into the box and I don't know, hallways that looks like in the uh, student center. The data team will process the power acts. Then there's a weekly drawing, and if you follow, you're down to the left, a monthly drawing and a semester drawing. And there are four winners, three winners, two winners. So what you're looking at is a very clear visual explanation of the system that this school has adopted for acknowledgements, right? The, um, the example on... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Penny. The example on the right is um, Harvest Park Middle School in Pleasanton. And they, I was just gifted, um, they shared this with me. Uh, they're using Google Docs as a, as a way to acknowledge their students. And so if I have Barb in my class and I'm going to send her an acknowledgement through this Google form that says, Barb, you know, thanks for being respectful by keeping your microphone on mute or what have you, and I send it to Barb electronically, that then, uh, that acknowledgement is logged on a Google Sheet. So they're able to look at their student population and say, wow, I noticed that Alice hasn't received any type of feedback, um, and so we need to make sure we address that. So it's an it's a, um, automated way to track that all students are getting access to that positive feedback and support. I like what Patty just said when she called it feedback. It's another way to talk about what the acknowledgement system is about. It's about being able to give feedback to students so that we can promote the behaviors that we would like to see. And what Patty's been talking about is the system. So while it still is building in drawings and having rewards and turning into tangibles, it's really more that those tangibles and the system is reminding the teachers and the students in high school, student to student is really important as well, to make sure we're giving these feedbacks. And as frequently as we um, 
see is necessary when we take a look at the data, when we want to establish a positive social culture in our classroom as well as in our schools. So I want to um, bring to your attention a document. If you don't already know about it, it is on the pbis.org website. The link is there on this slide. So again, when you collect the slide from the um, California PBIS.org website, actually it's PBISCA.org website, um, you would be able to have that link, but it's just at PBIS.org under resources and look at classroom. And what's beautiful about this document is Patty was talking about the systems you need to have. And then what we're gonna spend the rest of today talking about is how do you take a piece of that system, the acknowledgement piece, and do that in a way that builds internal motivation for your students to do the right thing, even when nobody was looking, even when there, there isn't um, somebody watching over their shoulder. They just know it's the right thing to do uh, for all of humanity. So I want to bring your attention to this document because it is the evidence-based practice. You can see that it has the foundations that we want to do as teachers. What are the prevention practices, which is what the acknowledgement system and using the acknowledgements are about uh, is prevention. And then what are the response practices when that isn't enough, because it isn't always enough uh, for all kids. What I want to bring to your attention is when you pull up this document and you start going through it, you will notice that it, for each one of the evidence-based practices, gives elementary examples and secondary examples. So looking at the secondary research, it will give you examples of what all of these uh, evidence-based practices look like in a classroom. And then it gives you non-examples, which is really great because some of the non-examples are what I think a lot of us have been doing and didn't realize it was a non-example, not part of the evidence-based practice. And then it gives you the research that supports that. So it's an incredible document. If you haven't already used it, um, it's there for you um, to use on the pbs.org website. We're going to move into acknowledgements and the idea of how you use acknowledgements, as Patty said earlier, to build relationships, to build connections, and to increase our communication with students. So the idea that we're going to talk about is behavior-specific praise, and you're going to see it as we move through these slides, it's just called BSP. Um, but what behavior-specific praise is, and pre-corrections, those prompts and pre-corrects, is, as Patty said earlier, a teaching tool. And it increases the use of desired social-emotional competencies by our kids. And it often will uh, be most useful or have a larger impact on those kids who are impacted by trauma. And certainly, this missing your senior year um, being able to go to, to prom and graduation is certainly um, putting some of our students in that mode of trauma. So we want to make sure that this is a method that will help specifically address uh, trauma when you're looking at what we can do with our students, the behavior specific praise. It's a powerful tool for building student self-esteem and a positive sense of self. So when we look at the difference between behavior specific praise and what we used to do in the old rewarding um, method in teaching, the one that I came into teaching with, is that behavior specific praise is gonna build that internal motivation. Kids are gonna be able to own, oh, this is because I did this, not because she likes me or because I dressed nice today or because of who I hang out with. So we're really gonna talk about how it develops that um, positive sense of self. Behavior specific praise is, um, recommended to be at a ratio and you'll look at the literature it's all over the place four to one five to one um, students that have a lot more difficulty in school it's significantly higher there's some research that will indicate it's like it's 15 to one if you want to help kids that are having tremendous difficulty or you want to change behaviors but i think everybody's just about accepted that ratio as a five to one on error corrections so when you make an error correction we need to have five positive comments to fill in that space in order to change the environment again to be positive instead of that negative hanging out. It just to me shows how incredibly um, significant those negative comments are. And we have to make them, we have to make corrective statements, um, but how much more we need to add in the positive about what we want to see. There's that saying, you get what you want. So why don't you talk about what you wanna see? 
Uh, relationships are the key to resilience. That's why we're talking about relationships, connections, and communication, and the fact that if we do this, it's really going to strengthen our relationship, show kids that we care about them, and build their attendance in coming to even this distance learning. We want to make sure that we communicate, and Patty mentioned this earlier, that if you're collecting your data, you're going to find out some of those kids that you forgot to mention. Because um, some of the kids that need to get these positive comments and have this relationship connection and communication with us are the kids that are sometimes the hardest ones. And whenever I think about and I plan and I practice on how to give behavior specific praise, I always think of that kid that I think would laugh at me the minute I said anything to them. Um, and how would I have a communication with them and how does my, my direct honesty really help support that communication. Um, you want to make sure that you're sharing your positive affirmation um, with the students. Um, just know that it goes a long way. Many of you that have been in education for a long time, kids are going to come back to see you. That's what they remember. That's what they talk about is the connection that you made with them. And that's what's holding them through this time. So when we talk about behavior specific pay, praise, I just want to give you some guidelines on what that means. It means that it's behavior specific. We're going to talk about the behavior, not the kid. Not I like you because it's going to be about the behavior. And honestly, you have to practice this. We didn't grow up this. We grew up with good boy, good girl. I did. Some of you are probably a lot younger than I am. But you want to make sure that it's behavior specific. You're talking about the behavior. I like to also make it setting specific, meaning during this reading time or during this lab time or during this time that we're having independent chats. I like to also say what the setting was that it happened in. And student specific. If you've got a student use their, and if you're talking to one student, use their name. If it's a group of students, use whatever that group is called, but be specific that it's about the student. And then I like to connect it with the school-wide or the classroom-wide behavioral expectations. It helps them cement that into what's the greater good. I did that because I'm being responsible. Some of our kids don't make those connections that that means I'm respectful, responsible, or I operate with integrity. Oh, that means I, I showed honesty. So connecting it to your school-wide expectations just adds a bit more strength to what you're saying. You want it to be timely as soon as you can to when the event is happening. That doesn't mean you can, can't go back and say, well, yesterday the class was really on time, we got a lot done, but more for your buck when you say it when it's happening. And relevant, it needs to be um, something that the kids uh, find relevant. You know, so that's the whole part about developmentally. And the five to one, getting to that ratio. And that I, I wanna add too, because, um, because we work with teenagers, there's that whole um, that whole need to um, for our delivery to be developmentally appropriate. And yeah. so, if we were to deliver a behavior specific praise statement to a senior in the same way we deliver it to a second grader, they they have a look at us and think we were growing horns. So we definitely want to be sensitive and use language that makes sense to teenagers. Um, and I would also encourage you to teach this skill to students because. You know, it, it's a form of communication, as we've said, and it's a great skill that students can put to use as well. Right. And it's, it's uh, as Patty said, the difference between a senior and a second grader, there's a huge difference between a senior and a freshman at how I would even talk to them. So that's really important to be thinking about that. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt one more time. There's some conversation in the chat about when you say five to one, do you mean if I redirect you, Barb, I once that the that the ratio should be for me to to um, provide some positive level of feedback five times. Yes, that's what that means, and that's not easy to do. So it's a goal. Um, there's some games that you can play um, where you say it to everybody. I want. Let's see how many times that we're going to have positive comments. And in high school, that doesn't mean just you. That means positive comments to the classroom. So when you're looking at a class and you've made a corrective statement even to an individual student, that five means getting five positive comments out there in the environment that that kid is in. It doesn't mean you have to find five positive things to say about that particular student. So this is really about changing the um, social dynamics that are happening in the classroom. And it's a goal. I'm not saying it's an easy goal either. And as far as there's continued conversation about authenticity and inauthenticity of how we deliver. So 
I'm wondering, and obviously don't unmute, but how many of you on this call are coaches and think about the way you give directions, the way you give your athletes feedback when they've done something well, when they've carried, I'm not a football person, but when they've uh, <laughs> blocked the quarterback, I don't know, you, you know, how do you deliver that message to them in a way that you want them to do that again, right? And so you would deliver this message in the same way. Nobody would expect or nor would it make sense for a high school teacher to try to deliver, like I said, you know, nice job doing your homework. I like how you wrote your name on it. We can, we communicate with students every day. And within that, that normal uh, style of communication, we would add some positive statement about what the student demonstrated that we want to see demonstrated again. So there's no need to be inauthentic or, or hokey or squirrely. So. And this is one of the things that you can use your, your um, classroom matrix for. Because in the moment, sometimes these are hard to think about what, what it is that you want to say that you wanted them to do, but you can glance at your matrix and say, oh, well, during, during group work or during individual work, these are the behaviors we expected to see. And you could comment on those behaviors or so they're right there in front of you. Any prompts we can have during instructional minutes is really helpful. So here's the slide you've been able to see about some examples and non-examples. Patty, you want to add anything or we're good? We're a little bit um, no, I just, you know, I like how, um, <laughs> oh, maybe we didn't use that one. Yeah, I, it really seems to help the class uh, flow smoothly. And one of the other ones I saw, sorry, said that might mean we'll get out early. I'm thinking that would be a, this one, there that would be a nugget for, for students. Yeah. Yeah, right. So yeah, there you go. we have those. And one of the things you'll notice was missing was tying it to the to these um, classroom behavioral expectations. So here's some examples that show how it's tied to the classroom expectations. Again, only because it adds a little bit more oomph to what it is that you're trying to say. Because when you build those expectations with your students, there is already buy-in that this is what we're gonna do. There's not buy-in, there's stakeholder participation about what they were gonna do. So they wanted this to be part of their room. And then the why, you know, what are we gonna get out of it by doing this? This really helped us get out earlier today. We got a lot more work done today. So here's some good examples of how you give behavior specific praise and how we can use that in our um, virtual classrooms or in our distance learning. Again, I make myself notes. I come up with all kinds of new ones and I stick them around on the room and I get practiced at using them so that um, when I need them, I can just pull off that idea. What we're gonna do now is um, break into some Zoom rooms And I think Patty's gonna give you directions while I get the Zoom room set up. And yeah, I, um, so I've been watching the chat and there's a lot of chat -er about um, how do you give acknowledgements in a non-hokey way. I think we can adopt that term now, hokey. <laughs> in, a non in, in an authentic way. And so I think Barb, we couldn't have planned this any better. We're gonna give you that opportunity to be in these breakout rooms um, and share with one another, how do you go about acknowledging students? Um, and, and how are you establishing and maintaining connection now? So um, how did you deliver that when we were face to face or when we can talk to students live in that respect? But what about now? How are you continuing to use that strategy, that evidence-based practice of behavior specific praise or acknowledgement in our current situation? So. When you get in there, if you could just take 10 seconds, introduce yourself, you know, maybe say where you're from, and then these would be the two questions that we would want you to, to be talking about. Now, I believe we have 20 minutes. Is that correct, Barb? No, we're gonna only have 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes. 15 and minutes. you'll get a notice that says one minute, the room, and it'll automatically bring you back into the main room. And I will, um, once you enter the room, I will post these questions in the chat so you can see them. Okay, all right, I'm getting ready to move you now. So watch for it, accept the move, and go in. Uh, this gives you the chance to unmute and have a conversation with each other. There should be about eight to nine of you in a room.
I don't have anybody not showing up in a room yet, but I can still see Laura and I can still see Rachel. So I don't know if that means you're not, that you get invited to a room and you're not going or not sure what to do. If you're just joining us, you're going to notice we've moved everyone to bake breakout rooms. And your name will be picked up and moved to a room in a moment. Samuel, uh, Phillips, I show that you're not in a room. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, I'll find a room for you and I can move you. Sam, can you hear me? I was kicked out when you tried to transfer me over. My name is Paul. Oh, okay, Paul, I'm gonna move you to room five. Do you know what room you were in? I don't, I, it might've been nine, but it might've just been that I heard you say nine, nine <laughs> <Okay>. people. <laughs> All right, Paul, I'm gonna move you to five. Sam, if you're in the main room and you want to go to one of the breakouts, just unmute yourself and let me know and I'll move you out. Or if anybody else is left in the main room, let me know who you are. I only show one person. Hi, Barbara. If you want to move me to a room, that'd be great. Okay. Are you Sam or Francisco? Who are you? Sam. Sam. All right, Sam. I'm going to find a room and move you. Sam, I'm going to move you into five. Sounds good. All right, there you go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sam? No, I got moved, Sam. I'm looking for Francisco or Amber. If either one of you can hear me and you want to go to a room, unmute yourself, let me know, and I'll move you or put you in a room. My data shows me that there's about 17 people not in a room, and the only one I show for sure the name is Amber's. So Amber, if you want to unmute yourself and let me know, I can put you in a room. We have about five more minutes in the chat room. Those of you that are in the chat room, there's 16, I think, of us. If you want to unmute yourselves, 
we can have a little bit of a chat um, here about how are you acknowledging your students and how are you um, establishing and maintaining those connections. To start closing the chat rooms and bring everybody back. It takes about a minute before the rooms actually close. So if you've finished your conversation and already come back to the main room, know that everybody else will be joining us in about 43 more seconds. I have a little countdown. It's kind of fun to watch um, that the whole group will be back. I find this technology amazing that it actually works. <laughs> And we keep trying it and having everybody experience it. So maybe we can get better at using this type of uh, system with our kids when we're working with them. Feel more confident that we can drop in and listen to what they're saying and move around in this uh, virtual space. We got about 70 of us back. Oh, it's growing quickly. So the rooms are closing in the next five, four, three. All right, we should be back. Everybody's back with us. I hope you had a good conversations with your groups. We try to allow a little bit of time for us to talk with each other. And I think we would like to oops, do a little debriefing, Patty, because I'm stuck again and frozen. If you can do that while I stop sharing, carry the conversation for a moment. Mm -hmm. Sure, we were just um, hoping that you could share some of what you heard in your breakout room, um, either something that you're doing that's awesome or something you heard someone else say that was awesome with respect to this acknowledgement. So we're hearing private student uh, comments to students through Google Forms or Google Voice. Um, I've, I've been on other webinars and heard people um, express some concern. And I think someone posted in this room too uh, about using your personal cell phone. And there are ways to reach out to students that don't require you using your own social media or your own phone number. And Google Voice is one of those options. And every time I'm on these webinars, I think, gosh, we need somebody on the, the that can help us coach us through some of this new technology. Um, many mentioned the difficulty of connecting with students during this time. And I think it, there is some truth in, in just this, that we need to take some very, to be very intentional about making some of these connections and it's hard. And I would also just really like to, to promote this idea that it, this should not just be the teachers that are reaching out to students and We've been doing some work with virtual check and check out and talking about how you sh this this wealth can be shared. So assigning, you know, five students to um, one of the, you know, paraprofessional or teaching assistants and 
your front office staff, and it seems like all the adults want to get involved in, in reaching out to these students. And so tr don't try to own, you know, high school teachers may well see 100, pe 100 plus students in a day. Please don't try to own that, but let's let's get all adults um, in the building involved. So right, and and the students in the classroom. That whole five to one becomes possible when everybody's involved. And how can we make positive statements with each other? Uh, there's been some comment about how you can be authentic with these and how it has to be authentic and not not canned. And I'll tell you honestly, at the beginning, it's going to feel very canned um, because you're trying to use words that you're not used to using. That was why when I first started this years ago, I started making prompts for myself and then it become much more natural. Then really, whenever I think about how I'm gonna write a behavior specific praise or how I'm going to say that, I think about, and I'm not kidding, I think about that kid that is a pretty tough guy or gal that's gonna laugh at the fact that I care about what they're doing. And um, I practice there. And honestly, it's human nature, they do like it. It makes a difference and it's a way to make connection, but you're right, you've got to mean it. You really need to be authentic in what it is that you're saying. And, and that's why following these rules of behavior specific praise will help you because then you're gonna get away from that, getting stuck in, oh, it's because I like you business. It's really gonna be about their behavior. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. Whoops, here. So we just have a quick minute, Patty. You wanna introduce it and then I'll go to Kent. Sure, this is a new app that you can get. Um, and I do think if you go to the Apple store, you have to spell out, it's called be positive. And I think you have to actually type out positive, the word. But this is um, in the true spirit of the University of Oregon and data. Um, this is an app that you can use to prompt yourself to provide feedback. Um, and I was playing around with it one day and I, prom I set mine for 1120 pre-correct my students that to clean up and uh, it's lunchtime. And so now every day at 1120, I keep getting this notice. Anyway, we're gonna play, Kent McIntosh tweeted about this and how he's using it. So we'll share that with you. It's a little slow. Oh, something went wrong. Try it again. There we go. There we go. Do a little app that we've developed called Be Positive that you can get on any Apple or Android device. Show you a little bit about how you can use this for distance learning. So what you can see here is I'm right on the main page. There are four different micro apps. I'm just gonna click on this first one called Reminder. And what I've got here is two preset reminders that I can use, opportunities to respond and specific praise that I want to cue myself to increase while I'm doing my distance instruction. So I'm just start right here. Now it's set as a two minute reminder and that's gonna cue me on my watch. It's gonna cue me on my phone and so on. And then if I want to actually track my behavior, I can just tap up and down for any session that I want to, and it's right in there. If I go back to the main menu, if you look at this pre-correction alarm, this is a really useful way to remind me on a pre-scheduled time things that I want to make sure to do. So what you can see here is I've got a check-in, check-out check in with Trey and his mom, and that's Mondays and Fridays at 4.30, so that's gonna cue me there. I also wanna make sure for Trey that he comes to my live sessions, so I've got him here, and that reminder sets me up 15 minutes before I can send him the login info, make sure that he's coming to live sessions. And then of course, for my higher ed instruction, I wanna make sure to remind my students to give them a bathroom break because, <laughs> yep, I sometimes forget to do that too. Cue over here, the counter I showed you before, and then I'm gonna show you stats right down here as well. You can look and here's my rates of specific praise for all the sessions I had. Click on progress and I can show that over time. This is what I'm doing with you right now. And then what I can do is I can hit the share button, click over to mail, and I can send myself or anybody that graph that we just showed and the data right there. Thanks everybody. Take care and be safe.
so the question was um, the app is called be positive but I'm pretty sure when you go to the Apple the App Store you have to spell out positive you can't use the plus sign you have to P O S I T I V E so um so it's a really a great reminder because this is one of the things that we don't do naturally and we need to be reminded in order to do. It's also one of the evidence-based practices that gets us the most bang for our buck, does the most for us, and it's the one that we use the least. So that's why we're spending time today on figuring out how to make sure we're using it in our distance learning. And we just kind of have this here, um, one of the other briefs that is targets um, student voice and um, just as a reminder, and Rob Horner, who's one of the you know grandfathers, if you will, of PBIS, I don't know if you'd appreciate that terminology or not. I think you would. I don't think so. Uh, he's, he says, he's, he has made it quite clear that you, you can't do PBIS in high school without student voice. And when I work with schools, I, I, I really always try to push and encourage them to think further about how to engage your young people. So if you're building lesson plans right now, uh, how can you get these students involved? How can you perhaps give them an assignment to do a video on time management or some skill, some academic behavior that might be helpful for them? Um, they have a developmental need to be involved. And so let's, let's invite them to be a part of that. Um, so I know we're on time. I can't tell you enough about pbis.org. Um, when you go to the home page, it's going to, the very first thing is going to be all the new briefs that they've come, been coming up with for responding to the COVID. But then if you go to resources and go to the high school, all of this is there for you. It is exciting to actually have research done on high school and not being able to take research of what they did with elementary and middle and think that's the same thing we need to do in high school. Human behavior is a human behavior, but what Patty just brought up, developmental differences are so significantly important. Um, just to let you know, too, that um, the California Technical Assistance Center uh, website is also available to you. If you go to resources and scroll down to high school, um, there's previous webinars, there's previous high school symposiums, the keynote speaks, uh, speakers are there, the PowerPoints are there, really just uh, things about implementing PBIS in high school, it's there for you. Um, again, resources and scroll down to high school. P, and that's the California Technical Assistance Center. So it's pbiscaltac.org. And this is just, and you'll be able to click on these, I believe, in the PDF. But these are some, so we have a national high school, um, actually international, APBS High School Network. And these are some previous resources that have been created. And so I invite you to visit and look at some of these. The PDF will be on that California website. I will post it again so that you can get all of these materials. Right, so that's pbisca.org, Patty, that helps you out. Mm -hmm. And then here is the um, URL that Patty's also going to post that is the evaluations of today. And while yes, we wanna hear how today went for you, the final question is something we really wanna hear from, particularly for high schools, is what is it that you need to know about? What is something that would help you right now so that we can gather that information and bring it to you in a, in a webinar like this. We have a few more opening spots in May, so if something comes up, we can pro probably do that. We had no idea that these um, webinars were going to be so well received, so we moved them into May as well. If you are not sure about those, go on the, the uh, pbisca.org website and you'll see all the webinars to sign up. There's another one specific to high school, but there's several more that really cross all grade levels that you might find interesting as well. So be sure to do that evaluation. We do look at them to help determine what we're going to do next and particularly what we're thinking about doing in June, which might be all about coming back. Um, so what would be your needs there? In closing, we want to remind you all that we do have a recognition system in California, um, and it is on that pbisca.org website. This particular year, we moved away from the typical um, do your TFI, turn in your results, and apply for it. We're moving into something called California PBS Community Cares. It's open. It's there. Go to the website, take a look at it, it explains. And what we're doing is sharing great things that we are all doing across the state 
um, in order to reach out to our kids. So it would be very valuable to have as many high schools as possible share what they're doing on there so that we can share that with other high schools. We are continuing with the conference and I believe this year at that conference we may have more um, information on high schools than we usually do. We also have a high school symposium that happens in, in March, but this one is a conference really specific to PBIS um, across all levels and across all uh, multi-tiers. So that is still up and going for September 21st to the 22nd. We do want to accept proposals for great things you might be doing at your school sites. Check it out on the website under conferences and see if you'd like to submit a proposal to do a presentation about your school. These are a few of the upcoming events. If you've gone to the website, you've seen what they are. Uh, May 20th is where we're going to talk about the power of the high school classroom matrix, very specifically about how to use that in a virtual classroom as well as in your classroom, the power behind that, how you use it as a teaching tool and a responding to problem behavior tool. Be sure to keep checking that because we are going to be adding websites. You're going to see they're not every day. There's some holes in there. So we're still looking at um, adding some more websites onto that. And Barb, I just want to comment that thank you to you all for all of the behavior specific praise that you're providing Barb and I about providing high school resources. And none of it seems hokey to me at all. <laughs> Oh, good. We like it. We're into non-hokey. We're good with it. We want to thank the Santa Clara County Office of Ed and specifically to Stephanie Tag. She really brought up this idea of getting us all together and, and across the state trying to address something at least every day for anybody that could, could sign on during that time. Patty and I really want to thank you for today. Um, we appreciate what you've been doing. Uh, we appreciate the transformation that we've all been going through and trying to move from what we normally do with our kids into this extended learning, um, reaching out beyond our classroom. So thank you very much. We are recording this, web, this uh, webinar and it will be at that same site, the same place that you go to for the folder for today's date. Uh, give me a couple of days and it will be up there and you'll be able to download it um, from the pbisca.org website. And the chat, if you want to save some of these resources, the chat, the three little bubbles to the right at the very bottom, and it'll, it'll prompt you how to save them. So, Particularly if you've got some great links from everybody else in there, you're going to want to save that. So thank you all for being with us today. I'm going to um, close things out and say goodbye. Anybody wants to stop sharing? And we can see each other for a moment, those that are left. So we can all wave. Those that we can see, click yourselves on, wave to each other. Woo, we're in this together. <laughs> we're brave souls with our high school kids. <laughs> we record, you want to turn recording off? Oh yeah, I do. I get so involved in looking at everybody. Bye, bye, Bar Beater. I don't know who that is. I, hi. Connie, this is so fun. All right, I'm going to stop.